Good evening, everyone. My name is Kevin Butterfield. I'm the executive director of the Fred W. Smith National Library for the study of George Washington. I'm actually in that building tonight in my office uh, and thrilled to welcome you from your homes uh, for another virtual Ford Evening Book Talk. On behalf of the Mount Vernon Ladies Association, welcome to our monthly events. Uh, so thrilled uh, to explore the uh, rare books and manuscripts trade uh, of, of today and the ways in which it gives us a window into the past. I, I'm really excited uh, for, a, for you to have an opportunity to meet Nathan Rapp. Uh, but I do want to tell you about a couple of upcoming events um, uh, be before I get there and, and introduce our, our guests for tonight. Uh, the last week of this month, uh, the week of October 26th through uh, 30th, that is Monday through Friday, we're going to have a series of wonderful events uh, for all of you at home. They're registration required, but free events uh, that we'll be able to bring to you to look at, at essentially elections across American history. Uh, and I want to talk to you about first one of them that will be on Monday, October 26th in the evening. And that's our USC, that's our, our partnership with the University of Southern, of, of Southern California, um, a USC partnership with the Saul Price School of Public Policy. Uh, we have an annual George Washington leadership lecture uh, that we do with them. So, of course, this year we'll uh, take the conversational format as we uh, have tended to do uh, during uh, the virtual events of, of 2020. Uh, but we'll be looking at electing a U.S. president then and now. There will be a short conversation between me and Professor Denver Brunsman of George Washington University on the origins of the Electoral College, the ways in which we elected our first president. Uh, followed by an exciting conversation between USC professor uh, David Sloan and Norman Ornstein from the American Enterprise Institute and one of the great scholars of politics today. Uh, the polarization of American politics, the ways uh, that elections and electoral campaigns have changed in the last uh, decade or two. Going to be an exciting opportunity to look at how we elect our president. The entire week, Monday through Friday at the noon hour, uh, so that's noon Eastern, Monday, uh, October 26th through Friday, October 30th. We're going to have a series of conversations on elections in American history. Uh, the theme for this year's George Washington Symposium is elections that shaped the American presidency. Uh, the first two will involve elections of George Washington, both his running for office in the colonial uh, Virginia setting, and then his, of course, his elections as president in 1789, 1792, uh, and, and what followed immediately. And then we'll look at some great elections on Wednesday. We'll look at the elections of Abraham Lincoln, 1860 and 1864. On Thursday, we'll look at the all-important election of Franklin Delano Roosevelt in 1932. Uh, and on Friday, we'll look at the election of John F. Kennedy in 1960. And we're going to have great guests. I won't go into great detail, but you'll be able to see in the chat a, a, a link that could take you to registration and more information about our fall symposium. Uh, and now for tonight's Ford Evening Book Talk, and thank you to the Ford Motor Company for your support for helping to make these happen uh, month after month after month. Uh, Nathan Rabb is one of the world's most knowledgeable and respected experts in historical documents. He's a principal at the Rabb Collection, uh, where he helps many of the country's great public and private historical uh, uh, manuscript collections in the country. Uh, he helps to build these uh, and, and works to put many things on the market so that people can have an opportunity to buy a document, a, a, a piece of the past. And that's something I'm excited to talk with him about tonight. Uh, but in the process, he learns a lot about these documents, including how to tell the real thing from the fake. And that's something else I'm really excited to explore with him tonight, uh, the discovery of forgeries. Uh, Nate has worked with, among many other institutions, uh, the Library of Congress, the British Library, uh, the Washington Library here in Mount Vernon, uh, and he's advised the families of many of the great historical figures on the treasures that have descended down their family lines. We're talking Thomas Jefferson, Ronald Reagan, Dwight D. Eisenhower, James Polk, the list goes on and on, uh, and he's a recognized presence in the media. And it turns out a great author because I've had an opportunity to read his exciting new book, The Hunt for History, and I'm excited to talk with them about that book uh, tonight. Nate, welcome. Boy, I feel so important. Thank you for having me. That was quite an intro. <laughs> you are important, and I'm excited to talk with you. Um, I wonder if you could, uh, I, I, before we get started uh, and, and diving into your um, your uh, emergence into this world of, of buying manuscripts, buying autographs, exploring the past, um, uh, let's start in the, closer to the present. Um, why did you write this book? Tell, tell me a little bit about the, the origins of, of your decision to tell the world about your story. So, you know, when people think of what we do, they think of the Antiques Roadshow mentality, the, the Pawn Stars mentality. 
And to me, that misses so much of the thrill, the hunt, the connection that you can have with pieces of the past. This is at the beginning and the end, an emotional pursuit. We're out there looking for pieces of history. Many of these pieces of history have never been seen by the public. Uh, they, people may not even know that they ever existed. I mean, some of these things are true discoveries in the genuine sense of the word. But what takes a piece of paper or a piece of parchment, uh, vellum, from being worth a, hand, a fraction of a penny, which is at the end of the day what a piece of paper is worth, into things that are, you know, have great research, uh, educational, financial value, is what's on them. And, you know, the connection with the people that are there, what those people can tell us about the past. But, you know, from my perspective, it's also what they can tell us about our own lives and where we're going. So, you know, the idea of taking what we do and making it into, okay, here's this emotional connection we as Americans have to history just seemed like more of a transcendent approach and a way to tackle, you know, the Antiques Roadshow uh, mentality from a, from a different angle, from a more inspiring angle. Now, I, and I, this is nothing against Antiques Roadshow. It's quite a good show. Uh, but, at, you know, to me, it's holding a document signed by, you know, we'll say George Washington uh, is uh, an experience that can't be captured by a number. It's a, it's, it's, it's a great approach, and, and it's, it's one that I could tell uh, as I read your book as something that you you came to appreciate at a, at a fairly young age. Uh, and um, before we start to, uh, going into your story, uh, and, uh, and I know you have some images you want to share with us, too, and we could talk uh, while we uh, go through some of these uh, slides. Uh, I wonder, uh, I, I forgot to ask a question I often ask uh, to help people around the country who are watching as ground uh, themselves. I'm here at Mount Vernon. Can you tell us where you're coming from? We're in uh, suburban Philadelphia. Okay, uh, also mm -hmm. near the, uh, the the heart of American history. That's outstanding. We're right there, right in the cradle. Okay, so let's uh, let's uh, uh, talk a little bit about your discovery of this world of, of uh, autographs, rare books, manuscripts, uh, and I, I say that you came to it at a young age. Tell us about the origins. Um. <clears throat> Well, I kind of grew up with it. My dad was a collector uh, long before I was born. He uh, he collected from his childhood. Uh, when he was a young boy, uh, he read history books, and his father bought him a, a handful of small things, mostly objects, not documents. Here he is right here. Uh, he's 11 years old. That Obviously, that's my dad holding the rifle on our right and my aunt on our left. Uh, so the, the, the genesis of the business was from the perspective of, of a lifelong collector. I grew up with it in the background. My dad started this business when I was in middle school. So I kind of, you know, it sort of circled around me. You know, I have early memories of, uh, you know, our family trips were to Gettysburg, to Colonial Williamsburg, to Mount Vernon. I went there as, uh, you know, as a young child. Here I am at a Civil War reenactment outside Philadelphia. I am, I'm going to date myself right now, I am five in this photo. Uh, I'm obviously, I'm the little kid, not the man with the hat on. But, you know, you look at that photo, you get a sense of what my life was like. You think that my dad wore this Civil War hat because it was a Civil War reenactment that we went to. But in reality, he just wore that hat everywhere. That was just <laughs> his hat. <laughs> So, yeah, I mean, you know, for Halloween, when he would go around with us, it would be, you know, he'd wear a tri uh, a tri cornered hat or some, you know, he had a, a union uh, uh, union uh, a Civil War uniform that that he would wear. Uh, so we just kind of grew up with it. Uh, we went, you know, this was certainly not the only reenactment that I that I went to. And well, you know, you, when you've he's, given us the sort of history side of your way into this. I, in reading the book, I also learned that. Uh, baseball cards and other kinds of collecting were another part of the of your formative experiences. Is that right? Well, that's what I cared about. I mean, yeah. you know, I, I, I you know, as my, I, I did this because my dad liked it and you do, you know, just as something to do with him. But what I cared about was the baseball cards. And, and if you went to a baseball card show, there would invariably be some history related material there. But I went to I met Sandy Koufax. Uh, I met Mark McGuire, Pete Rose. So, yeah, we used to go to this collecting mentality, this association with these objects was something that, you know, and the first autograph that I remember my dad buying was a, a uh, signed photograph of Babe Ruth. You know, my recollection is he spent $300 back then and told my, asked me not to tell my mom. 
Um, I don't think I did. I think I kept that secret. <laughs> so just now, or, or the book, anyway. <laughs> well, the book blew the cover off it, so you know people know now. Uh, of course, it would be worth a lot more than three hundred now, but you know. And then you know, I would go to shows with him, or you know, um, you know, autograph shows around the around the the eastern in the east coast, mid Atlantic. That's great. Um, well, let's uh, let's uh, go go farther into your story. Right now, you're five years old. You're learning about this world. Uh, how do you how do you how do you start to become more involved and more engaged with it? Well, I went off to college. Um, uh, what's the next? What's the next slide? The there it is. So before I go off to college, I'm I'm writing letters to famous people. I'm I'm somehow getting their addresses. I, I I can't honestly I can't remember how anymore. But here's a letter that I got back from Colin Powell. I had asked him who his uh, inspiration was, and he told me, as you can see, George C. Marshall. Uh, his parents uh, deserve the credit, but you know, I wrote Colin Powell three times and I, he wrote me back every time, you know, well, now, you know, whether he was sitting down typing these, that's just back when there, you know, people were typing letters, as you can see, 1993, yeah. um, you know, whether he did that or some aide did it, I don't really care. You know, the, the bottom line is he, he thought enough of the, the effort to give his own in return, whatever that was. So I was, I was touched by it. And I, I wrote Ronald Reagan. He wrote me back. I wrote, um, uh, Dr. Seuss. He wrote me back. Um, so, you know, I kind of, you can kind of see it's sort of like, you know, it's like the dust around me that gets kicked up. It's kind of everywhere. That's great. And, and one of the things that, um, that I see here is, um, you, you clearly had asked him a question, right? Uh, you're not writing, uh, asking for an autograph. You're writing for, uh, an insight. You're writing to, uh, to better understand this person. Well, that's not an accident. The, 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 the advice that my dad gave me was, you know, uh, fluff up their egos a little bit, they're more likely to write you back. <laughs> so, you know, you ask them, you ask them questions about, um, you know, you, you say something that you admire about them, which in this case was not hard with Colin Powell. And, um, you know, they tend to be more responsive. Um, but, you know, I only wrote people that, that I found interesting. I wrote Francis Crick on the subject of uh, uh, cloning. I was, you know, I was reading Michael Crichton's uh, Jurassic Park at the time, and I saw I wrote him about cloning, and he wrote me back a letter about the ethics of cloning. You know, I mean, who would have thought? One of the things it helped that, I, that I was a kid. Yeah, yeah. Um, and one of the things that I learned in at the, about this stage of your uh, uh, developing career or, or uh, interest in this area, anyway, uh, in the book was uh, that you you. And your father would often chat and look at catalogs and 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 listings of, of things that were that were for sale um, or perhaps becoming available at auction, and um, and discuss what was the real treasure in the in the dung heap. You know, sort of talk about what what's the one thing that really stands out to you out of all of these things. And I found that so fascinating uh, that you're flipping through a catalog of hundreds of things and trying to identify the real diamond. Yeah, well, uh, that is the hardest thing to do. And that's the thing that takes the longest to learn. You know, people's first question is, how do you know it's authentic? You can, you know, that's the first thing you, you have to learn. If you don't know something's authentic, you can't even be in the game. The heart, the challenge is to know enough about history, the context of history, and a specific person's life to be able to assess the importance of a document. So, okay, let's assume that everything in this book is authentic. Everything in this, we'll use your, your example, this auction catalog, you know, is authentic. Okay, well, what is important? What has someone missed? Why would this be worth X and this be worth Y? And that is a lesson that, that you learn over the course of a very long period of time. And, and, you know, really what I went through in, you know, without really knowing I was doing it was a form of an apprenticeship. Mm -hmm. uh, because, you, you know, apprentice learns by, rep by being around somebody who's knowledgeable. But over the course of years, by repetition, 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 to the point where you've seen enough that you you sort of it, rather than think through, you know, a specific uh, issue, you feel it before you you know analyze it. So you know, Malcolm Gladwell wrote this book called Blink, where he says, you know, somebody who's really an expert in something will immediately have a sort of a visceral reaction to it, that a feeling about what's authentic or what's right or what's wrong. And they're, they should they do further research, but their research serves not to overrule, but it generally serves to reinforce 
that initial reaction. Same as, you know, you all, if you're looking at a letter of George Washington, uh, you know, the, the folks that work in your library would know, uh, you know, a good Washington letter versus not one. And they may have an initial feeling about something, but if they continue to do that research, that initial feeling is only going to be bolstered. It's not, it's, it's very unlikely to be, you know, erased. So is it time to talk about forgeries as a part of your story? Uh, <laughs> uh, it is, it, you're right. It's one of the questions that I'm sure you get all the time. And it's a question that just in my time at the library uh, where we don't authenticate, uh, but we are happy to give people uh, our thoughts about uh, what they bring in. Uh, there, there, it, it is a, an important part of, of what we do when we deal with these documents is to, is to separate the, the real from the fake. And uh, tell, tell me about uh, maybe an early formative experience or some way in which you um, started to, to, I won't say master, maybe you're not, maybe, maybe that's the, a stronger, stronger word or the wrong word, but where you started to feel comfortable making those uh, judgment calls. So, you know, for the first five to eight years, I don't think I would have, so the way these things work is people call us and come look at collections. And by the way, we don't authenticate either, except for pieces that we're considering acquiring. It's not a separate service that that we would that we would offer, hmm. um, without my dad being there. And the reason is that I just didn't feel like I had the the enough built up in the bank of experience to to do that. And because the you know the the acquisitions that we make they can be in the six figures, and so making a mistake is a consequential one. It's not you know without its issues. Um, the very first thing that my dad gave me when I joined the business was a book by. Uh, somebody who we'll come to later named Charles Hamilton, who wrote a very uh, a compelling book on the forgers, the great forgers. And, and they're artists. I mean, a good forger is an artist. They're an unethical artist, but it's, it's artistry. You know, they learned to write at a time when people were taught how to, they were taught penmanship. You know, if you look at a letter of Washington, it's beautiful. And not only that, they didn't have lines in their paper, but they might as well have. I mean, it's more or less... Uh, a straight line, and there, it's not by accident. People were taught to write up until relatively recently. Um, yeah. But these these forgers, they they mastered. But what the book said is that the, the lesson that Charles Hamilton tried to impart was forgers have their tells. They can be good at one thing, but they can't be good at everything. So Joseph Cozy who is a very well-known forger of Lincoln. He did Washington, but really Lincoln was his wheelhouse, Lincoln and Franklin, Benjamin Franklin. You know, he didn't quite master the signature. He could write a decent letter, and there are tells with a, with a cozy forgery, but the signature has a clear, he made the same mistake every single time. He didn't get the signature perfectly. I mean, you look at someone like Robert Spring, who was a well-known forger of George Washington, um, and, he, he, you know, he, oh, there you go. There's Robert Spring. Robert Spring had a uh, had a thing that he liked to do. He liked to write checks and passes. And so this is a, a check that, that we had. This is not signed by George Washington. It's a forged document signed by Robert Spring. Uh, in, in the, it's purportedly in the hand of George Washington. I don't think it's a great forgery. I think it's, it's not. not one. Yeah, it's really not. Yeah. Um, but like, it, it, there, you know, there are aspects of it that are quite good, right? Like I, I, the Mount Vernon yeah. at the top, the 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 M O U N T, it starts it starts pretty strong actually, and then uh, it gets farther from what I would easily identify as Washington's hand quite quickly. Yeah, I, I agree with you, and I actually think in, in, weirdly, usually the signature is the best aspect of a forgery because they practice it a lot more often. Weirdly, I think the signature in this is the is the weakest element of this forgery. <laughs> Because it's you know Washington's signature was really bold and majestic. I mean, to me, this just it looks like a almost like a poor tracing. But in any event, so you know he wrote these checks, and so when you see these checks, you know nine times out of ten these days they're forgeries, or they were passes allowing someone to pass through the line during the Revolutionary War, and they were always the same road. So Charles Hamilton had this joke, you know, if if these were really passes then no doubt there would have been a traffic jam because of the number of these passes that Washington, that, that Spring wrote out. Um, so Spring is, is probably the most, to my mind, I mean, there certainly are forgers. I don't think, I don't know that he's the best, but he's the most well-known because he's such so early in the 19th century, back when the, the autograph trade was just sort of getting started that he realized, hey, rather than have to buy originals and sell originals, I can just make my own. Hmm. 
Let me uh, tell our audience out there uh, that now, now is a good time to be entering some questions into the chat of however you're watching this. Uh, and we can come to those questions quite soon. Uh, I think for the uh, um, sometime after uh, 7.30 Eastern, uh, we'll start going to audience questions. So please be posting questions. Surely some things are jumping out at you as things you'd like to ask Nate Rab. And uh, uh, maybe it's on the question of forgeries. And maybe it's on the question of, of, of the real thing. Uh, but is now a good time to talk about a particular Washington forgery that uh, you go into some detail in, a, about, uh, in the book, Nate? Oh, I'd love to. Yeah. Great. great Let's do it. Uh, so tell us the story. It's, it's a particular story that actually also brings in uh, as a, uh, a helping, uh, a helpful partner with you, uh, Michelle Lee, now Michelle Lee Silverman, who is a, a librarian and a great uh, uh, part of Mount Vernon for several years, who's now at the Folger Shakespeare Library. But tell us a, a bit about the story and this particular forgery. Was there a slide before this? There, that one, that's the one I want. So S Charles Hamilton, first of all, M Michelle and I for, for years went back and forth and we still would today if I was dealing with a lot of Washington forgeries, but I haven't had the opportunity. She has a real interest in this and she and all the other folks at Mount Vernon were, were, were and continue to be huge assets to us in our work uh, to sort of better understand the things that come our way. This was one thing, a colleague uh, someone who's been doing this for for a decent amount of time quoted us what appears on its face to be a section of a survey of Mount Vernon in the hand of George Washington. Now, Kevin, you'll have the same reaction I had, which was this looks off to me. There's something wrong. There's something there are multiple things wrong with this piece of paper, this document. It came with a certificate of authenticity from the, the very man who wrote the book on forgeries, uh, Charles Hamilton. Oh wow! So that and and that's how it was sold. I mean, you know, it it, it teaches you. You know, I don't know if, uh, how many people in in who are watching saw the movie. Uh, will you ever Will you ever forgive me, or can you ever forgive me? Uh, about Lee Israel starring Melissa McCarthy. At the end, she's she's a forger, and she goes to a book dealer who's selling her back, trying to sell her back one of the things that she forged. And the book dealer is saying it comes with a certificate of authenticity. And Melissa McCarthy says, does that certificate of authenticity come with a certificate of authenticity? And I think this proves the point, which is, first of all, honest people can make mistakes, um, but also to question, to be constantly questioning. Uh, OK, well, this is this person's opinion, but what's mine? Mm -hmm. So this came with a, a certificate of authenticity. And we began looking into this document. So this is a survey of Mount Vernon purports to be. It, I think it was quoted to us at 35,000, which is not unreasonable for it were it to be what it purports to be. We began looking into it because it was intriguing to me. Okay, well, is this real? I don't think so, but let's keep looking. So um, next slide. Next. We begin looking. I find the same draft. This, so there are three different documents here owned by three different people. The top one is a draft document that sold at Christie's. This is decades ago. The middle one is the document that was authenticated by Charles Hamilton that we just saw. The bottom one is a document that was donated to Colonial Williamsburg and is, to my knowledge, still in their archives. What drew my attention is that this, the same crossouts, th these are drafts. So Washington would create a draft and then create a final. These are drafts. The final sold at Sotheby's again decades ago. So I now have four different copies of the same document. One's a final, and there are three drafts. Now, could Washington have created three drafts? Well, I guess it's theoretically possible. Would they have crossouts in the same place? That seems awfully fishy. So it's a lot of this, a lot of authentication is just common sense. Why would Washington create three different copies of the same document, cross them out in the same place? The top one proves my point. Penmanship was something that people learned. Look how straight and almost neat in spite of its crossouts. It's almost neat in spite of it. It looks like it was written intently by somebody who ought to have been writing it. The bottom two looked off to me. And the reason I cut these portions out is they're the same place in the document. Yeah. The Christie's copy and the Williamsburg copy are actually full documents with the survey drawn on top. The conclusion we ended up coming to in analyzing, I mean, if you look at that middle one, the lines kind of go down and then back up. I mean, I'm not even getting into the nitty gritty. They form this letter this way and that letter that way. You don't, you almost don't need to. Um, 
you know, somebody once gave the analogy, if you were to turn a document upside down, you could no longer read it, but you could get the feel for the document. You could sense the flow of the ink and the pen without being distracted by the individual words. If you turned these documents over um, and looked at them upside down, uh, which I have not done, um, but I suppose I could, I venture to, to guess that the top would look authentic and the bottom two would not. Yeah. The conclusion that we came to was the bottom two were forged by an unknown forger who had access to the one on the top. Now, could that have been out of an early catalog listing? Possibly. It's also possible that the person had access to the original. They may have sold the original and then sold subsequent copies. Um, but we came, but it shows you two things. First of all, honest people make mistakes. Uh, there are forgeries in, I would venture to say, nearly every library in the world, some of them by intent. I know Mount Vernon has a good collection of uh, forgeries collected by intent. And I will note that the person who, who tried to sell us, and, can, you, do you mind if I say this? I don't uh, mind where the piece. Um, the person who, who tried to sell, when, when we told him that we didn't think that it was good, ended up donating it to Mount Vernon, which, which was nice. And it sits um, in that separate forgery pile, by the way. <laughs> correct. It was. It, I should clarify. It was donated as a forgery, and in okay. fact, Mount Vernon was helpful with me in in my research to figure out. So there. So you know, ways that we worked together. Mount Vernon had a copy of the catalog in which the original Sotheby's document sold, and they they provided me with that. So we were able together to sort of trace this document down. But you know, the challenge, and this was an early lesson, is question everything. Don't assume because somebody said this was authentic or because it comes with a certificate of authenticity from anyone that it is, Do you, you know, approach things with a skeptical eye. So the bottom two are forgeries. The top one's the original. Uh, I don't know where the top is. I assume a private collection, but I know where the bottom two are. One thing uh, that I think a lot of viewers may be wondering about is your description thus far has been uh, very much about um, your approach. Uh, uh, assessment of things based on, you know, sort of accumulated, accumulated experience. Uh, some people may be wondering where, where science is, you know, where's the, is there any sort of CSI angle to these kinds of authentications? And I, I'm just curious to hear your answer because I actually don't know uh, what you'll say about authenticating the age of paper and, and those kinds of things in a scientific manner. Uh, that's, that's a good question. It's not an uncommon question. You know, the the short answer is that in cases like this, if you need that level of scientific, well, aging the paper wouldn't have helped you because they would often find old paper and old ink. Well, not old ink, but old paper and, and use that paper. I mean, that was a common. So finding something on a 18th century piece of paper that was a forgery of George Washington would back when these guys were around was probably the rule, not the exception. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but, you know, this kinds of forensic authentication, there are certainly cases, complex cases in which I can envision that being used. Uh, generally speaking, the massive material that comes our way, if you need that level of scientific support, you're probably in the wrong business. Um, you know, it could, it, they do really wonderful and interesting uh, forensic work with some of the really old manuscripts where things are written over other things to determine what's underneath them, uh, to find things which may be contemporary copies on top of other things. But with with, with documents like this, um, I've yet to encounter, you know, a, a, a situation in which that was a requisite. Interesting, that's great. Well, uh, tell us um, uh, did, uh, more, I know you had a couple more images you wanted to show people before we go to some audience questions. Uh, what else would you like to show us? Well, you can decide how much time you want to spend on this. I definitely don't want to shortchange the audience. But, you know, I, I want to hammer home a point that I mentioned early on, which is this being a, an emotional pursuit. So this is there was a family, the Allen family, and we bought their archive, um, all of it unpublished, none of it known to have survived, you know, the couple hundred plus years. They were reverends during the during the Revolutionary War. They were uh, supporting the colonial cause. The author of this document was a man named Moses Allen, who was preaching out of Georgia. Uh, he was captured and thrown into a prison ship, a Revolutionary War prison ship, which is not a place one wants to be, um, a British ship off the coast of the South. And there he met and became friends with a man named Mordechai Scheftel, 
who was a very early, probably the most prominent Southern Jew of the colonial Rev War era. And they became friendly. Um, Moses did not take well to captivity and tried to escape. And he drowned off the, the, off the boat. He drowned trying to swim to shore. And this piece of paper was fished off of his body and returns to his brother, Thomas, uh, who was a hero at the Battle of Bennington. And I mentioned this for two reasons. First of all, it's an incredible it's an incredible story about the friendship between a reverend and, uh, you know, an early Jewish leader and the friendship that they made together, but also the fragility by which history arrives at our doorstep. You think of history as just being there. Of course, we know history. It's in a book. Well, how does it get to a book? It gets to a book because things like this survived in spite of the odds. And so, you know, this was fished this, you know, you can see it as water damage. It's fished off the, the corpse of a man trying to escape a prison ship in the, in the war and then survived subsequent to that through generations and generations. And you can see what it says. Uh, the next slide. Pork for dinner. The Jews, Mr. Sheftel and son, refused to eat their pieces and their knives and forks were ordered to be greased with it. It is a happiness that Mr. Sheftel is a fellow suffer. suffer. He bears it with such fortitude as is, is an example to me. Wow. It's just incre incredibly powerful. That's amazing. What what year was this? I want to say 79. Mm -hmm. I think it's 1779. Don't you know? I could be off by a year, but yeah, uh, it's a, rem a remarkable story. And uh, um, where where does this uh, document rest now? Do you know? We were contacted by a descendant, a Sheftel descendant. Wow. Who bought who bought this? Yeah, so, you know, which is wonderful. And then that, by the way, that happens. I mean, you get descendants who find family history and, and that's always, you know, gratifying. That's great. Anything else you want to show us before we go to some questions? I think there might be one more thing. I can picture something from uh, Susan. Oh. Andy, right? oh, right, 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 right. Yeah. It's um, awesome. So this came out of a private collection. It was mixed in with a lot of other stuff. It, you know, I sort of, I look at it from my own perspective because it was written to an autograph dealer. Mm. And the autograph dealer made the unforgivable uh, mistake of trying to sell Susan B. Anthony a bunch of autographs and portraits of men. She did not appreciate that. And I, sh I suppose she could have just thrown the letter away, but she chose to write him back. And the response to me is it, it highlights I have a, a wonderful daughter who, uh, you know, you try to give her a sense of perspective and, you know, where we've come from and also where we're going to. And I just I challenge people to read this letter and not come away with some form of inspiration, not only for the people that have done this hard work before us, but for, you know, where, you know, the 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 the, the country we want to live in. I know you think women are the pets of society, but to be a pet is not to be an equal. And what I want for women is for women to be equal before the law in every respect. I challenge you to read that and not feel a little bit of a tingle. Yeah, that's amazing. That's great. Um, uh, and this is, of course, the 100th anniversary of, of uh, women's suffrage, uh, the, uh, um, uh, the ratification of the 19th Amendment. So a remarkable uh, way for us to connect uh, to the past uh, in this moment. Uh, thanks, Nate. This is great. So uh, we've got some questions starting to come in, uh, and I've got more for you, so I'm happy to, to pepper in as, as appropriate. Uh, but we've got one question coming in about uh, people writing on behalf of someone else. Um, so if an employee were writing on Washington's behalf, such as a farm manager or a Washington relative, or I would add one of his secretaries, uh, does it complicate the authenticity process for you? Uh, and I might add to that, could you talk a little bit about letters that are written by other people and then um, signed or otherwise handled by the principal, the person that you're actually uh, uh, supposedly um, uh, that it's coming from. Uh, could you talk just a little bit about these letters being written by others for someone like George Washington? Yeah, well, and there, and there are a lot of letters that are written in someone else's hand that Washington then signed. I mean, for us, it's quite obvious. Washington has really distinctive handwriting, and so it's differentiating true. someone's handwriting from Washington is not a complicated chore. So there's two, uh, there's, you know, I'm not sure which was the primary question here, but in terms of whether something's, you know, written the body of the letter is written in some in one person's hand and then signed by washington himself uh you know that's a letter of washington and we we make you know some distinction but it's not a huge distinction because in many cases washington was dictating those letters and by the way some of the people writing the letters the body of the letters were famous i mean so during the war you would find alexander hamilton 
who was a secretary of George Washington during the war. So finding a letter in Hamilton's hand signed by Washington is pretty cool. Yeah, yeah that's pretty cool. Uh, in terms of uh, farmhand writing, I mean, uh, you know, you all at Mount Vernon may have a better perspective on this than I do, but I've never seen a letter where someone was authorized, some third party was authorized to sign Washington's name. And even if they were, I would think it would be easy to differentiate the, the handwriting. Yeah, I can't think of that either. Yeah, it, it, but it, it is, um, uh, I, I know the, the initials that are used in, say, a documentary editing project of ALS versus uh, LS, so autograph letter signed uh, versus just a letter yes. signed. Yeah. Uh, it, it is That's a distinction. Correct. It's one that jumps out at you in a documentary edition. Uh, but often, as you say, those, uh, those letters signed are written by uh, people um, of, of, of at least some notes, uh, if not uh, quite the magnitude of George Washington. Uh, let's talk yeah. about, about George Washington's signature. Uh, this is a great question, and I'm excited to hear you talk about it. Uh, what are the parts of the signature that shows it is for sure George Washington's? Um, and actually, uh, I might throw our producers behind the screen uh, a bit of a, a, a curveball. Could you put up Robert Spring's signature? That might help Nate talk through this. Uh, perfect. Um, so talk to us about George Washington's signature. So, you know, there are two ways to look at this. First of all, I would never authenticate a document based solely on the signature. You want to authenticate something in the context of the entire document. So for me, it matters. Even if I don't look at the signature, let's assume I have my hand over the signature. I would know it was a forgery without even looking at it for two reasons. First of all, the handwriting's off. But secondly, it's the standard format for a known forger. I mean, it's just not the kind of thing that Washington was 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 writing with enough frequency. And it, it's, it is what Robert Spring did. The yeah. signature itself, this signature, first of all, looks shaky to me, but it's really bubbly. It, it's, it seems compact. Uh, the dots on the right side of the G are, you know, inconsistent. The W doesn't have the points that one would expect to see. Um, it almost looks like the G he ran off the page. So the bottom of the G is, is wrong. Um, you know, the short answer to your question is I could write, I could fill a page with the reasons that signature is wrong. The law, the, the more complicated answer is when I first started doing this, I had a hard time seeing the difference. And it really takes repetition, repetition, repetition until you get to a point where you can feel the difference. You don't just see the difference. You feel the difference. And there's just all the, you know, it, you know, looking at something like that, and I'm, I'm sure the Mount Vernon folks are in the same boat. It, you know, it, it's almost like, you know, fingers on a chalkboard. It just, it's just wrong. Yeah. Yeah. There, there is a certain um, uh, sense of command in Washington's signature. It just, it just feels very uh, um, uh, commanding and, and strong. Uh, and this one certainly lacks that. I think you, you mentioned tracing and that's a possibility, uh, but, but I, I, it certainly doesn't have that strength. And then uh, you, you identified all, all those kinds of things. But I know the Washington Papers, the Papers of George Washington Project that's been going on since 1960, Virginia, they have a nice little uh, guide to identifying handwriting that sort of goes in that letter by letter sense, right? The, the things that you were saying are the details that you could fill pages with, um, including how far the S goes below the line, in this case, the S in Washington. Those kinds of things are, are things that we can um, uh, go in a very specific and detailed approach to, uh, but I, I think you're right. It's it's a uh, it's it's the the, the thirty thousand feet view of this is it tells you all you need to know. That's great. Uh, let's talk about uh, another question uh, that takes us into the nineteenth century. Um, this is a question that uh, um, uh, deals with the Trail of Tears. So your book uh, uh, describes a Trail of Tears letter, uh, and I wonder if you tell that story a little bit about the document itself and uh, what we know about the document. So we bought a, a group, a, an archive uh, from the descendants of a well-known Civil War general. And at the bottom of this, and sometimes things are places where you don't expect them to be. And the bottom of this was a little signature, like, you know, maybe yay big, uh, a piece of paper from a larger document, which had, which was signed, it said to my uh, Choctaw and Chickasaw brethren, as I recall, it signed Andrew Jackson. Um, it was separated from whatever document that originally came from. But as we sorted through this box, and it literally was like a U-Haul box, you know, I mean, we realized that the rest of the letter, or most of the rest of the letter was still in there, but that it had become detached. It had basically crumbled away. And mm -hmm. there were pieces that were missing. So it became like a, putting together a, a puzzle. So 
So, you know, my dad and I, this is back before my, my wife joined the business, my dad and I sat in front of a table and literally pieced the thing together. Uh, you know, this piece goes to the top right, this piece goes to the bottom left, until we realized that this was a letter of Andrew Jackson uh, telling the five civilized tribes in the South that, you know, they were not, they were going to fall under state jurisdiction and be subject to state laws unless they moved west and promising them that if they moved west, that everything would be OK and they'd be left alone. Now, we know how that story ends. It does not end well for them, um, which is why the you know, I referenced the Trail of Tears. Technically, the Trail of Tears was was later, but this sort of kicked the ball, got the ball rolling to answer the question um, about, you know, how that happens, you know. I, I, the short answer, I think that it was the bottom of a box, which is not really, you know, outside of plastic, which is really not where you want something to be. Um, it, it, you know, then things move around and it gets pushed up against and, and it can easily get get damaged. In this case, the letter was a little acidic. And so it was a, br a little bit more brittle than you typically find. So we sent it to a conservator and the conservator reassembled it using a technique called leaf casting where to draw the letter back, to take out the acid and, and to put it in a sustainable place. So uh, this is clearly an, an authentic letter and we've just talked about forgeries in the, in the very specific Washington sense. Um, but I do wanna, I'm curious uh, as I was reading the book, what one of the things that um, I, I don't wanna dissuade anyone from reading the book, I highly encourage you to read the book, but one of the things that will be painful about the book are the occasional stories uh, people who have their their perception, their understanding of maybe a price, a, a family heirloom, or something that they felt deeply connected to, or a collection that they had built up themselves over time, uh, discovering that it's either a not a, not real, a, an actual forgery, or just maybe not at all worth what they thought. And I wonder if you could talk to us a little bit about that experience of dealing, uh, encountering people who bring to you things with great hope in their eyes. Uh, and you have to be the bearer of bad news. Uh, and I, I don't know if you want to talk specifics or just in general terms about that part of this profession. Yeah, I mean, we definitely write a lot of large checks, but the 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 other side of that is that we we don't write checks to people who think that they ought to receive one. And um, some of those are very well-meaning people who just don't know. Uh, we had a woman who had inherited a letter of actually George Washington who was in Connecticut and she wanted to drive down. And I, I think I tell the story in the book. I can't remember. You do. You do. But I remember the I story. I think I do. Yeah. And she wanted to sell us this letter. I think about it all the time because she was like so understated about it, but she, you could tell she was shaken. And she wanted to sell this letter of George Washington. And I said, send me a picture. And she says, no, no, it's real. I want to come down and, and sell it to you. And I said, listen, you can, I'm not going to stop you from coming to now today. I would stop them because of, you know, the whole virus situation, but back right. then people were allowed to come into the office. <laughs> and, um, I said, you can come down, but you could, you know, you could do the six hour trip. And I, you know, I, I'm going to know, I'm going to have that blink moment. I'm going to know within two seconds, if it's authentic, that's on you. She came down, she told me she was, had saved this letter, had been passed down and she wanted to her grandson was at the point where he wanted to go to college and she had promised that she would help to pay for it. And I took one look at that letter and I was like, that is an obvious forgery. There's no, uh, there, there's no good news I'm about to impart. So I just decided, you know, um, being honest with her was the best way to handle it. You know, I'm sorry, but this would not be for us. It just doesn't look like, you know, try and soften the blow. I didn't say this is a terrible forgery. You wasted your time. I say, you know, this just doesn't look like Washington's handwriting to me. I'm sorry it wouldn't be for us. And she just, I just remember her looking at me and going, that's not good news. Yeah. <laughs> I don't mean to laugh. I mean, I'm laughing sort of uncomfortably. Um, yeah, of course. But, you know, and some people are rude about it. You know, we had somebody who offered to sell us, and I, I'm not trying to get political here at all, trust me, um, a signed photo of uh, Donald Trump, John, not Donald Trump, his Chinook helicopter. Um, which would not be something that we would buy from any president. I mean, it's not, it, you know, we're apolitical. Um, we're, we're in the business of history, not in, not in politics. But, you know, when we told this person that it wasn't for us, that, you know, this was not, this was a picture of a helicopter, not a person. Um, the, the person became belligerent, made really inappropriate uh, remarks to my wife who was handling the situation. And uh, it, it became ugly, you know, so 
those people I feel less sorry for. The grandma trying to put her child through college, I'm 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 deeply empathetic. Yeah, uh, that's, no, that's right. Uh, well, let's go to uh, we've got another couple of questions. I think um, I wonder if you could talk to us a little bit about um, finding these letters. Now, this asked about friends helping you find letters, but uh, maybe speak more broadly about the 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 um, the ways in which you're connected with people who have these things. How do you how do you find these things? Uh, is is it at this point everyone knocking on your door, or do you have, do you go out there and and uh, seek things out in in ways that are are worth telling? Um, besides going to a rare books fair or something, what else do you do? So at this point, it's ninety nine point nine percent of people find us. Hmm. Um, there are a host of people out there who are collectors, sort of professional collectors, and by that I mean that they buy with the knowledge that they will be selling, as opposed to most collectors who buy with the intent to keep and pass down and to enjoy. Right. Um, they're sort of, they're more hobbyists, I would call them. Uh, the, you know, our place in the market, this may be beyond uh, people's level of interest, but we are not, everything that, that we sell, we at some point own. So we buy everything that we sell and keep it for however long we have it. Uh, that is different than the auction model. So somebody looking to sell something could consign it, which is an effective representation. You know, Christie's will represent you in the sale at their at their public sale. Uh, our business model is to buy things outright. And so that's the that's the niche we have carved for ourselves um, in terms of friends helping find the letters. You know, I wouldn't know how to find that. I mean, you know, from your perspective, how would you know where a George Washington letter was? I mean, you may sort of over the course of years develop a sense, okay, well, this descendant has some, this descendant has some. But, you know, beyond that, you know, we're, these things are hidden in people's attics and basements all over the country or even the world. We've bought Washington documents in Europe. Um, finding them would, would, the time it would take to find them would far outweigh the, the, the value when, you know, every single day we have 20 to 30 people knocking on our proverbial door to sell us something. Now, most, you know, we're not going to buy a signed photo of Britney Spears or Michael Jordan, but, you know, we have so much incoming our way to sort through that going out on the road, you know, in, the, in a flea market style approach would would be time inefficient. One, uh, So I get your emails, uh, as a lot of people in, in, in my line of work do. Um, and one of the things that I see in how you uh, uh, describe and, and share your um, your current stock or you know what you're um, promoting at that moment. Um, if, if a particular document from Abraham Lincoln or Thomas Edison or whomever uh, is, you always tell the story quite quickly. Like early on in your description of this particular document, you uh, you get a story going. You get us uh, as the uh, the recipients of the email excited about a particular uh, moment in time or a particular. Uh, course of events, and I, it's something I, I credit you for. You 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 don't let the document stand for itself. You make sure that it's part of a broader story. And I, I'm guessing that's something that just came naturally to you. But I don't know if you could talk a little bit about that approach to describing documents. Well, I'd like to take credit for that, but I think that credit goes to where credit is due, which is my dad. My dad was doing that before I joined the business, and uh, his logic, which I completely buy into, is that we have an excitement inside us and this is our way of sharing that excitement that historical passion with the person who's going to buy it people love our descriptions some people print them out and frame them with the documents that they buy hmm. uh you know these people i mentioned the emotional aspect of this people who are spending all this money they're not buying a piece of paper they're buying the story of the piece of paper george washington touched this well when did he touch it why did he touch it who was it sent to who touched it next they're buying the whole thing. And, and in order to tell that story, the background is, from my perspective, the background is necessary. So kudos to my dad. I mean, he may be watching now. I don't know if he is, but if he is, the credit goes to him. Well, you know, it's funny you say that. I've been up, I'm getting a little giddy in the moment because I'm sitting, you know, feet away or yard, several yards away uh, from Washington manuscripts and, and Washington owned volumes. And, you know, you start to get a little bit jaded. Sometimes you get sort of used to having them around. And then you stop and you talk about it in these ways about, you know, George Washington touched this at this moment in, in our history. And it is easy um, to get excited again. And I'm kind of wanting to run down the hall and, and poke around a little bit. I'm not going to do it, but I, I kind of would like to. It, it, it is an exciting part of this. Well, 
and you all have some incredible stuff there. I mean, speak of treasures, you know, you guys have quite a collection. Well, thank you for that. And you don't need to keep saying nice things, but I, I appreciate that. <laughs> uh, so is there something that stands out above everything else that you have personally found? This is a question coming from Alice. Uh, let's let's uh, leave your father, perhaps your wife out of the picture. Uh, what have you personally found that you think is at the top of the list? Uh, somebody asked me this the other day and I came up with a witty response, which I think I found wittier than the other person found. Okay. Cause it's, it avoids the question and it's unsatisfying to the answer to the, to the, to the asker, which is my most exciting find is often the most recent find. Um, you know, these things become, they live with us for a period of time and then they go on to the next, um, the next owner. So for instance, we've had Abraham Lincoln's order to blockade the Confederacy. Uh, which was deemed subsequently by the Supreme Court to be the act of war. You can't blockade your own country. That's an act of war again. That's an act of war. So it was deemed to be the start of the, the Civil War. We've had the order to seize the Rosetta Stone, uh, which is now in the British Library. Um, we've had a piece of the speech that saved Theodore Roosevelt's life with the bullet hole still in it, um, it sent from Roosevelt's uh, convalescent convalescence bed hmm. um you know we've had a document ordering from thomas jefferson ordering the first books for his library of congress the body speak of the body being in the hand of somebody else who's famous the body was in the hand of meriwether lewis who was his secretary signed by him wow. um you know i i can keep going the, yeah at some point there's like how many greats can you affix to before a document um, so it's often, so my most re the thing that I'm most excited about right this second is a large archive of, uh, material that belonged to the chief telegrapher, the telegrapher in Washington during the civil war, who went on to become part of the, um, the telegraph wars between the great robber barons of the 19th century, Gould and Vanderbilt. And he was the head of the Western Un union during some of this period, but he was kind of in the middle. And as such, they dealt with Thomas Edison, a really young Thomas Edison, a 20s Thomas Edison. He's in his 20s. And there's some really early, fascinating, unpublished, unknown documents of the young man as he was bursting onto the national scene, stuff that no one's ever seen before, signed by Edison. And I'm knee deep in researching it. So my gr the greatest find, it's so hard to answer that question because it's like, you know, it's like asking my dad who's his favorite favorite grandchild. I mean, I know it's my kid, but he won't say it. Um, it's hard. To, it's hard to answer. It's hard to answer. That's great. No, buy my book. There's a lot of great finds if you buy the book. That's right. No, there are a lot of great. And, and that Rosetta Stone story is in there actually. And it was it was the example that jumped out to me of you and your father talking about a big catalog or big listing of possible items, and trying to identify the thing that actually was the diamond in the dunghill and it was that letter that described the uh the rosetta stone as something uh that was uh that the british were about to capture or were about to send back to, to the british museum i can't recall exactly but it is a great story and if you've ever been in the presence of the rosetta stone which i have it, it it's it's a remarkable um uh, uh object in human history and so to, to have that letter um uh, is i can see why you were as excited about it as as, as you are uh, we have a time for a couple more questions. Um, so Joe wants to talk to us a little bit about uh, your process uh, to going public uh, with these things. So can you explain your process by whether you share a find with a news outlet, outlets or keep the document quiet? I can testify as someone on the other side of things that you sometimes go to news outlets and uh, talk about these things very publicly. Uh, so talk to us about this. Uh, I do go to news, news outlets, and uh, there is always a strategy behind the outreach. Uh, thank you, Joe. Uh, it's a good question. Um, the, the, the basic criteria, and by the way, breaking into the news in this environment is, is like pushing a boulder up a hill. You know, it's, it's a very challenging uh, um, it's a very challenging endeavor and one likely not to yield much fruit. But uh, generally speaking, I find that people have an appetite for this kind of historical, this history. And the criteria I, I use is, is it signed by somebody that the general public knows? Is it revelatory 
in the sense, does it show something that might be interesting to the public about who that person is, or is it an incredibly important piece of history? And does the price is the price tag high enough that it would attract the attention of somebody writing an article? Mm -hmm. If it fall, if it if it qualifies there, um, if it matches uh, if those three, and generally speaking, it has to do all three, then it's worthy of consideration. But there are cases in which morality steps in. I mean, I talk about a story in which we handle a letter of Martin Luther King, which who's written to someone who, in a, what I would call a flirtatious manner. And, and so, you know, we had a debate about where to go media with that. And, and we didn't because we felt that it, it just wasn't the right tone. It wasn't, it didn't feel right. So there are certain areas in which it satisfies the criteria, but, you know, we keep it, we, we, we keep a low profile regardless. That's interesting. I, I, that's a, um, it's a, a, a calculation you have to make with each document and each story. That's great. Um, so let me um, bring things to a close as we're getting ready uh, on the night that we're recording this. Some of you may be watching it later. Uh, I think many of us will be going off to watch a, a vice presidential debate. Uh, and I, I'm curious, Nate, if you've uh, discovered or have any uh, uh, important or particularly interesting documents to talk about about a vice president or vice presidents in our in our history. Anything jump out to you in the the vice president category as opposed to president? Uh, first of all, I will not be watching the debate. Okay, <laughs> I don't think I could take it. <laughs> um, yeah, we we had a document of so back when the vice presidents were elected separately and and um, the first sort of real election. Uh, which was 1792, Adams was vice president and by virtue of that president of the Senate. And so when the electoral votes were sent in under a cover uh, from the various states, it was John Adams, who was also on the ticket against uh, George Clinton um, for the vice presidency. So it was John Adams' job as vice president to receive the votes of the various states and to write them saying, hey, I've gotten your electoral votes in and this was like the first week of January of 1793. So we've we've carried a letter of, of John Adams as vice president receiving the electoral votes, which made Washington president a second time and made him vice president. Interesting. Yeah. So so he got to sort of take in the votes that that uh, that brought him back into office as vice president. That's great. Yeah, I don't think that would happen today. I think you'd have like 18 poll watchers and, you know, it'd be broadcast live on television. I don't think you'd be allowed to receive your own votes. But back then he did. That's right. Oh, that's great. Well, it's a great story. Uh, thank you so much for sitting down with us tonight uh, from Philadelphia. Very, very grateful for your time. Uh, excited about the book, The Hunt for History. Uh, uh, I hope that you've seen uh, those out, uh, out there in the audience have seen uh, links in the chat to, uh, to click and, and purchase this book. I think you'll really enjoy it. Uh, Nate, thank you so much. I don't know when we'll have you back to Mount Vernon, but we'll have you back sometime soon um, when we can all travel a little more freely. And uh, I, I just really appreciate your time and I enjoyed the heck out of it. Thank you. I'm grateful for the opportunity. Good night, everybody. Have a wonderful night. We will see you again soon. Remember the final week of October, some exciting events discussing elections in American history. Thank you so much. Good night.